Uh, okay. Good morning. Why don't we get started now? Um, it is 11 o'clock. This month's webinar, February, is on office ergonomics training, um, specifically talking about the new office ergonomics CSA standard that's out. And there is a component in there uh, specifically talking about education and training. Uh, and so that's what I'm going to focus on today for this Hot Topic webinar. Uh, so to give you a little bit of background information on me, my name is Sarah Snabel. I'm a registered kinesiologist. I'm a certified professional ergonomist, and I'm one of the co-owners of Pro Ergonomics. For those of you who maybe are new to Pro, Pro Ergonomics, maybe just tuning into the webinar for the first time, not really familiar with us, um, and for those of you who do know us, then this is more of a, a reminder. But um, for Pro Ergonomics, we are a team of consultants. We're all registered kins. Uh, most of us are certified professional ergonomists or working towards that designation. Um, and we work with a whole bunch of different clients, a whole bunch of different industries, um, helping them with ergonomics. So we do a variety of ergonomic services, whether it be training, whether it be risk assessments, um, documenting the job demands, uh, or office ergonomics in this case, setting up people's computers workstations uh, and providing training on that. So today's session, mostly going to focus on just this quick little snippet of office ergonomics and uh, how you can comply with the CSA standard. So my plan for today is to just talk super briefly about the CSA standard, just to introduce it to you, uh, make you aware of what's out there um, and kind of where I'm pulling this information from. Some of the notable updates or those key highlights that are in this standard. Um, so if you kind of want like the Cole's notes on where you might want to focus in this document or even determine if it's worthwhile for you to purchase because this is a document that you do need to purchase for download. And then um, today I'm going to focus on one element within the standard, which is the training and education, and highlight to you some of those key components. So the CSA standard, uh, just you know, quickly, the history on this is that there always has been, well, always since 1989, <laughs> there's been a guideline on office ergonomics, and they've gone through a couple of key overhauls. So 1989 was the initial launch. 2000, they did a pretty hefty overhaul. Um, I mean, you can imagine the difference in computer technology between 89 and 2000. Um, and so, you know, like addition of the mouse. <laughs> but they, they really did a big overhaul here and kind of made it more program, more process oriented. So it wasn't just about um, the computer, it was looking at um, implementing office ergonomics as a whole in terms of the program. And it was a lot more of a process oriented document. 2017, December 2017, so uh, just over a year ago, they implemented, they did another big overhaul. Um, maybe not overhaul, but overhaul in the sense that it became, it went from a guideline to a standard. Um, and what that, what this means is that they started using words like shall. So in order to comply with this standard, you shall do this, which means you must do it. So in order to be compliant with the CSA standard, you have to do these key elements. Um, they also have wording like you should, which is like an encouragement that you should do this to comply. And then they also use the word may, which means you have uh, some options. But that's really the big difference. Um, and so the standard is kind of exciting for us in the ergonomics world as ergonomists. Um, I'm reading through the CSA standard and, you know, I'm looking through who sat on the committee because it is a a volunteer process uh, and it's a lot of my peers so other ergonomists other certified professional ergonomists that I kind of know in the industry and as I read through the document it is very much in line um, if not identical to what you know we do um, just kind of from from experience right uh, in terms of how we would do an assessment uh, elements that we would include in the training so it is a nice document to kind of have as that backup that um, that justification uh, basically the the kind of paper as to you know justifying why we recommend what we do um, it's also um, for you as the employer it's a nice document to go to again to to justify why you might be purchasing certain equipment um, why you might be incorporating certain things in the design process it really is a good kind of go-to standard um, and it is much easier to read than kind of previous editions. 
So in terms of how you might be able to apply this, um, it's definitely going to give you some guidance from the design perspective. So it can go to your engineering team or your building or facilities, um, whoever's involved in that process. It can be used to help you with doing assessments, like an evaluation process, or if you were needing to do an accommodation for somebody. Definitely, this would be a document that you could kind of go to as a reference um, in terms of what you're going to include in your education, in your training. Um, again, it's a good reference for that. Um, and it's also going to be great for your procurement team. So anybody who's involved in purchasing equipment or furniture or accessories, um, again, this would be a good document. So I know a lot of times, uh, well, something that I hear quite often is that we're purchasing chairs, we have to go to RFP, um, and so we've gotten three or five bids or whatever it is um, from a chair manufacturer and purchasing chose the cheapest one. <laughs> Um, not to blame it all on purchasing, but often, you know, I'm just jokingly saying that that is, that is what we hear. Um, but this would be a way of, of them kind of understanding, you know, making sure that they're comparing apples to apples. So sure, this chair is a little bit more expensive, but um, it's it, um, adhering to, you know, what we've outlined in the CSA standards of what we need in terms of fit and adjustability for our users. So just a couple of key areas where you might be able to apply this standard. In terms of the cold notes, kind of the, the highlights, the updates, um, you know, if you are considering purchasing this or you have purchased it and you're not even really sure where to start, um, I'll kind of give you the positive of it is that it is much more concise than the previous guideline. Maybe you've looked at the previous guidelines from 2000 um, and it's long. The one from 2000 was over 300 pages. This new standard, the updated version uh, released in 2017 is only 113 pages, I think. They haven't removed any content. They have just made it a lot easier to read, uh, really cut down on some of the verbatim um, and simplified it. And again, as I mentioned before, they've, they've incorporated the, the use, the word shall. So they're using shall to say like to comply with this, you shall or you must do this. It is much more modernized. So it makes reference to, I think in 2000, they were still making reference to the big tube or CRT monitors. Um, not really a lot of talk about dual monitors, not really a lot of talk about um, like mobile workers, so like working from a laptop. Um, and those are things that are all addressed in the new version. So it does talk about different types of workspaces. So an individual workstation and a shared workstation. So you think about those people who work in cubicles and they have a dedicated workstation and equipment and things that you might need for them, but also equipment and considerations to give to shared workspaces like your customer service or your front reception where maybe you have five different staff rotate through there. So how do you make that workstation fit for all of those people? It makes reference to sitting versus standing, which I know, I mean, we should probably do another hot topic webinar just on sitting versus standing, um, but it does make reference to that. So it gives you a nice, like easy to read chart on tasks that are better suited for sitting, tasks that are better suited for standing, when you might be able to consider um, alternating between the two. And it doesn't say that we all need to have sit-stand stations. I'll give you the kind of the, the quick insight onto that. It doesn't say that we all need to sit or stand. It really does highlight that we need to be able to move and that our workstation needs to be able to include or incorporate that. Um, and moving can mean different things. It doesn't have to mean going between sitting and standing. It can also mean, um, you know, move, rolling in your chair, rocking in your chair. Um, it means being able to stand up um, to take a stretch break you know just things like that it, it, it highlights the fact that actually getting up from your desk counts as movement it also includes some reference to mobile technology so um, has a nice I, I love the laptop section super concise um, and it has some reference to tablet technology as well so uh, limiting the duration of time that you spend on tablets and ways to consider um, using better posture and then the, the focus for today is this education and training component. Um, and that's what I'm going to spend some time elaborating on the next few slides. In terms of complying with the CSA, uh, CSA standard, um, it's not necessarily um, law. There are lots of CSA standards where there are other um, maybe acts like the Occupational Health and Safety Act 
will, or the green book and the green book, sorry, will refer to, you know, use of CSA approved safety boots, for example. Um, but the CSA standard, the office standard, is kind of under that due diligence clause that workers are, are required to be, to identify and, um, and protects the safety of their workers, right? Take all reasonable precautions necessary to protect the health and safety of their workers. And this is where this would fall under. So it is definitely a best practice document. It is one of the best resources out there in terms of compliance. Um, but you know, if you're not complying with the CSA standard, it's not necessarily that you're doing something illegal. Um, it's just that this is one of the best references. And if you're providing a good, if you're providing a safe workplace for your employers and you are addressing every reason, you're taking every reasonable precaution, then adhering to the CSA standard would be um, a good thing to do. In terms of the education and training components, there's a couple of key elements that they talk about. Um, and it says that the organization shall provide so they shall provide education about the important role that the workstation um, and the layout of the workstation will play in their overall health, well-being, and productivity of their employees or the users. And also says that users shall be trained on how to address the furniture and arrange aspects of their workstation, like their equip uh, equipment, like the accessories, like your keyboard tray, for example, if it exists. Um, monitor risers uh, or monitor arms um, and I wanted to just you know flip away from that for example uh, for a second there and just talk about the difference between education and training because they do talk about them separately there that the organization shall provide education and that users shall be trained and so I think that in a lot of cases most organizations are likely doing a pretty good job or they're doing education at least it is very often a, more of a passive format so it's getting that theoretical knowledge it's letting people know about the potential hazards you know this is where you might see oh yeah we do office ergonomic education we've got um, a resource on our intranet or we hand out a flyer or we make them watch a module a lot of that stuff is is you know checking off the boxes for your education criteria and again it's you know educating everybody on how the workstation contributes to their their health and well-being right how it how it can impact them the training component is something that uh, likely there's a bit of a bigger gap and this is more about that skill development it's training is often more practical and it's teaching the users um, how to adjust the furniture so how to use the chair how to use the keyboard tray and what height should it be at um, how to adjust their monitor and again what's the proper height so it's again teaching them um, that how to and I think in this case in particular um, the chair is a really good example where the chair like you know just having a fancy chair like and I say fancy but let's say you have a chair that you're like oh this is a top-of-the-line ergonomic chair it costs us twelve hundred dollars uh, and that's great but just keep in mind that if you don't know how to use it or if the, the, the person sitting in the chair doesn't really know how to use it, it, it doesn't really matter that it was a $1,200 chair, right? They, couldn't, they maybe aren't using the features to you know, their, their actual intended use. Um, and actually there's a, um, there's a little quote that I like from WorkSafe uh, New Brunswick actually has this out and they often say like equipment and accessories can help um, or hinder in maintaining good posture, but they can't cause good posture. So I always think of that uh, that chair example in that case, right? So you could have this top of the line chair, um, and in theory, yes, it can help maintain good posture, but it's not going to cause good posture unless you know how to use it if you actually make the adjustment. So I want to focus a little bit on each of these elements, and. Um, in terms of the education and training components. So when you are providing education and training, there are some key uh, takeaways really that you should be trying to get across. So the number one thing, or well, maybe not the number one thing in terms of importance or anything, but the number one thing they have listed is working heights and reach zones. And what this means is that you are um, breaking this down in a way of, uh, you know, well, what is the right, working height and this could be 
the height of their chair. So making sure that your feet are sitting flat on the floor or that they're supported by a footrest and also understanding why. So um, you see the, the fourth line there is the potential health risks. So you could, in theory, you know, talk about all of these things and then talk about, you know, well, what happens if you don't do that? Um, and I would probably, as I was deli- if I, as I'm delivering education and training, um, kind of include those potential health risks with each element. So, you know, if you are not at the right working height, this is what can happen. So if your chair is not at the right working height, your feet aren't supported on the floor, likely what's going to happen is that your feet are um, maybe dangling or they're not fully supported on the floor, which then means that you're getting increased, you've got the chair um, doing like an increased pressure point on the back of your legs, which isn't great for blood flow. Um, It also means that you're more likely to rest your feet on the feet of your chair or the legs of the chair, right? Which is then, uh, you know, you kind of like tuck your feet underneath, which also is in a great posture. It puts increased strain on um, through your hips and your low back. So that's also not a really good posture. Uh, probably one of the bigger working heights that you would want to address here is the height of your keyboard and mouse. So all of that needs to be at your elbow height. You don't want it high, higher than that because then you're going to get um, raised shoulder postures. Uh, it creates a lot of tension in the neck and the shoulders and the upper back. And you also don't want it too low because you're going to find that people will tend to slouch. They'll, they'll slouch forward as they're trying to, to type and mouse when they're not at the right working height. Now, does this mean that everybody needs a keyboard tray? No. Again, the CSA standard is talking about, you know, you need to be, you need to be able to get to that good working height. And actually, they refer to it as the reference posture. So reference posture is sitting with your elbows at 90 degrees, your your hips roughly at 90 degrees, and your knees roughly at 90 degrees. And if you can't actually achieve that, then, you know, your equipment, your accessories, your workstation is not in not a proper fit. So it doesn't mean that you need to have an, a keyboard tray or that you don't need a keyboard tray. It means that you need to be able to get your keyboard and mouse to your elbow height. And so in some cases, you might need that equipment, but there may be other ways as well, like adjusting your chair height. Reach zones are um, also important. So they talk about uh, like a primary, a secondary, and a tertiary reach zone. So, you know, you're taking into consideration things that you most frequently use, and they should be nice and close to you. So then again, it creates a nice workflow. It's efficient. You don't have as many reaching or um, in the ergonomic term, er, uh, awkward postures. So keeping them nice and close to you. So that would definitely, for most people, include your keyboard, your mouse, um, maybe your notebook. If you are taking some handwritten notes, maybe your phone, depending how often your phone rings. But um, it might; those things might also fall, uh, like your notebook or your phone, might also include, uh, might also fall into that secondary zone, which is a little bit further away. The secondary zone is usually, I'd say, like outstretch your hands. Um, straight in front of you and uh, anything within that arm's reach would be within your secondary zone. So just keeping in mind again um, you know the equipment that you do as per the task so if you are somebody who has to use a scanner or a POS system um, keeping in mind the height of those as well um, and how often you're using those so how often how long um, Monitors also would be in a good example of working heights that would be included here. So what height should the monitor be at for that visual reference? Um, Multiple monitors, security screens, all all the different things that you need to be able to see. So that's one thing that should be included. (laughs) One thing, as I list a whole bunch of things. But but generally we're talking about working heights. So usually you you can break that down a little bit more simple is that it's the working heights of like your keyboard and mouse, like all your hand arm input, your visual working heights, and your seated working heights. That's kind of the, the simple way of breaking it down. You also want to include the importance of movement. And this is definitely something that is the modernized component within the CSA standard. And probably one of the number one questions that we get uh, is, you know, do I need to stand at work? Or everybody's asking for a sit stand desk. But it does highlight some key ways that you can move and what constitutes movement, right? So it does say that there are some tasks that are better suited to standing. There are some tasks that are better suited to sitting. and when to consider, you know, the option to sit, 
to alternate between sitting and standing. Um, also talks about movement, it, like movement counts if you are getting up to go do some filing, right? If you have some task variety built into your work day, all of those things are um, considered a movement, but part of this education, part of this training component is making sure that your that your staff know that that counts and that they're taking those opportunities to move. So yes, your job may be very sedentary in the sense that you're you know you do a lot of computer work, um, but you also need to take the opportunity to stand up to perhaps do a little stretch break. And here's why, right? There, you hear a lot in the media about like a sitting disease or the toxicity of sitting but we also need to make sure that we are educating people on well yeah that's stuff that stuff not it, i mean there is there are some definite health, health hazards to sitting for too much but also realizing that people have that um they have to take that on themselves to try to move as well right they have to figure out ways to do that um, and it's not necessarily that they have to have a standing workstation Definitely part of the training component is how to use the adjustments and the controls. So again, um, like I mentioned, that equipment and accessories can help with good posture, but they could also hinder it if you're not using it properly. Um, and so I remember when I used to work in-house uh, for a company and I kind of got referred to for a short period of time there with the chair lady. And I was like, oh, there's so much more that I do than just chairs. Um, but honestly, like chairs that come with three or four different levers on them, um, it's not, uh, it, it, we can't just assume that everybody is going to take the initiative to learn what all of those paddles do. Sure, yes, we would love it if everybody did take that initiative. But the reality is, is that uh, a little bit of training, um, whether it be you know, it could be one-on-one, -on -one, it could be a group session, it could be a little video that they watch where they're going through how to adjust that, but making sure that they know how to adjust them. Same, you implement a new keyboard tray, you implement a monitor arm, you just want to make sure that you're doing that added piece of making sure they know how to use it and why. And again, that covers off your potential health risks as well. So what happens if you're not adjusting your workstation, if you're not taking the opportunity to move, if you uh, don't have your monitor set at the right height, what are some of the health implications that could happen here? How can it affect your your health, your productivity, your well-being? Um, and really, we're talking about those musculoskeletal disorders, the strains, the sprains, um, in terms of how it can impact them. Uh, yeah, and you know, in this case too, you would be, you would probably uh, cater this to your workforce. You could definitely include some generic pieces on things that would apply to everybody. And then, if you had, for example, a group of workers that do a lot of laptop use or a lot of tablet use, a lot of, you know, outside the traditional office, uh, you may want to then highlight some key things. Um, on tablet, right? Which again, is gonna fall under your importance of movement. Um, it's gonna fall under your working heights and reach zones and the potential health risks uh, if, um, if not used properly. In terms of what I would suggest or what I would recommend really for you in terms of taking this back to your own workplace is to think about or review what do you already have in place? So do you address office ergonomics as part of your health and safety program, right? It doesn't necessarily mean that you have to have a whole separate office ergonomics program, or, but it does mean that you want to make sure that you're reviewing your health and safety um, and that you're not forgetting about the office staff. Like depending on your workforce, it can be easy to overlook the office because maybe you have quote unquote bigger hazards out on your production floor um, and then there are some places where you do offer office ergonomics quite well um, but it's kind of just been a process maybe more of an informal process right so ideally you've got some kind of a process really whether it be a policy whether it be a guidelines uh, guidelines or, or something in place of how how you're going to address office ergonomics and who's going to be involved right so if you're gonna um, if you are looking at purchasing the CSA standard then um, thinking about all of those potential stakeholders um, and getting them involved in the process. So from the design piece, from the procurement piece, 
um, from your disability management or your accommodation piece, from health and safety, um, just making sure that we've got stuff installed safely as well. Uh, there's just there's so many people that could be involved, and so having a process in place. So you know, every time we bring in some new furniture or equipment. Um, this group is going to look at it um, and it's going to get approved or we make sure that we identify these certain criteria before we bring it in. So just it helps to simplify things so that um, there's some consistency across the board, especially if you are a relatively large organization or if you're spread out or multiple departments who all seem to be doing their own kind of thing. Like maybe you find a whole lack of purple chairs over in department A and department B is buying all of the green chairs <laughs> you know and which one and maybe one of them is better than the other but in terms of like standardization it's just a really good idea I think anyways to have um, some kind of a policy or a program in place where you are addressing that take a look at some of the equipment that you already have um, specifically from an from an ergonomic eye um, and so it's not always just about getting the best price or, um, you know, something that aesthetically fits into the workplace, but really thinking about the adjustability that that product might offer and whether or not it's going to fit the users, fit the tasks that the users are doing. Um, a good example here is I know an office who recently just, they moved to a new location and they decided that everybody was going to get height adjustable desks great they just wanted to build that in that way then everybody had the option to go between sitting and standing um they bought 300 500 desks um, hundreds anyways and the desks don't go any lower than 28 inches which is the standard height of a desk uh, and they with these new desks they decided no more keyboard trays but guess what there was a lot of shorter people like you know pretty much a lot of people under uh, uh, Anybody under 5'4", for example, um, is probably a good candidate where the 28-inch desk is not going to fit them. Um, so here they had spent all of this money on all of this new equipment and still had challenges where the desk was too high in terms of, you know, the working height. The desk was too high for some of their shorter staff. Um, and the chairs that they had didn't go high enough. You know, say one of the options is to raise the chair up so they can get to the right working height. The chairs didn't go high enough, so we still had a gap. Um, so it's just a matter of thinking about the thinking about the task and evaluating that equipment from an ergonomic eye, um, not getting succumbed to some of the marketing language that's out there from some of those furniture suppliers. And then uh, look at what you're doing for education and training. So have you been doing some education? Is it really passive? Is it doing what you want it to be doing? Right. So. You know, if you're providing the education um, and you have been providing some type of training, but you're still finding that you're getting issues or complaints, um, maybe it's time to just look at it uh, and maybe put a fresh spin on it. Um, and again, take a look at the CSA standard and some of some in terms of some of those key components that you want to cover as well. So I'm going to open the floor to some questions here. Being mindful of the time, 11.28, we've got a few minutes. I'm going to read through the questions um, and I'll give you guys an opportunity to type them and you can use that chat bar on the right side of your screen. Um, while you're typing, I will just give you a little, a few other a uh, few other bits of information. Uh, Pro Ergonomics is hosting our annual industrial ergonomics conference. It's coming up in June and we are going to give away a free registration to anybody really who's interested uh, well if you're the lucky winner but if you're interested in winning a free registration to this um, following this webinar we'll send out an email um, all you need to do is reply and say yes i would like to win and you'll be entered into the draw if you're not the winner not to worry it's not a super expensive fee it's 89 dollars. you get continuing professional development points we're going to offer four sessions it's going to be held in mississauga um, so yeah, something to, to keep an eye out for. There's more information on our website as well. And next month we'll be back to the full hour length um, webinar and we're going to be talking about job demands assessments and ergonomic risk assessments. So comparing the two. So wanted to give you guys that info and let me go back to checking out the questions now. In the event that uh, you think of a question after the fact, you can always email me. Yeah, 
you can email me uh, or ProErgonomics info at ProErgonomics.ca. Um, give us a call. We love chatting. <laughs> we love chatting about um, office ergonomics. We like talking about anything ergonomics related, really. Okay, so um, let me just check. All right, I'm going to read out this question for you guys first. Uh, would you recommend having an office assessment per workstation as per a policy or by request? Would the CSA standard help with building that type of policy? Ooh, excellent question. Um, I would, <laughs> I would probably consider having a policy where, where you're determining how, how an assessment gets requested. So if you're looking at, um, you know, let's say somebody, a, a very specific user has some discomfort or an accommodation need or a doctor's note or whatever it is, I think your policy needs to address what you're going to do in those cases. If you're looking at it more from a proactive standpoint of designing workstations um, or looking at what you already have in place, you may want to consider type the workstations. And I guess that might actually depend on how similar all of your workstations are. So if you have, or if you're looking at a department and everybody has the exact same chair and the exact same desk, um, then you can probably do an assessment based on the type of workstation, um, especially if you're not addressing a specific injury or discomfort need. You may want to look at just addressing, you know, let's say you've got three different types of chairs throughout your location. Um, maybe you're looking at addressing those chairs, um, but I think that you would probably want to do it based on, you want to have kind of, you want to look at it in different ways, right? So what happens if somebody has an actual injury or some discomfort? How are you going to do that kind of an assessment? What's that process? As well as what are you going to do in terms of a proactive standpoint? The CSA standard would definitely give you some guidance on that. Uh, it's not going to tell you exactly how to do it, but you do need to kind of figure out how it's going to how how you're going to take that standard and apply some of that general information. How you're going to apply it to what works for your workplace. Hopefully, I answered that well, and we can always chat again um, in more detail. Let me read out the next question here. What do you think about the healthy muscle stretching pauses in the workplace that allows you to avoid muscular atrophy for the same position in the office for eight hours, sitting in front of a desk? Oh, like stretch. Oh, so so what do I think about uh, taking stretch breaks? Um, I, I definitely I think stretching definitely counts as movement, uh, and I'm all for that. Um, and I just think that if people don't really, mm, there's some different apps, you know, like that can stretching reminders that pop up. I don't know if those all work necessarily, but just trying to educate people on what constitutes movement. Um, maybe they don't want to formally take a, a quote unquote stretch break, but just reminding them that, you know, standing up, uh, let's say the phone rings and they stand up to answer the phone, even if they sit back down immediately, I kind of call that like a posture reset. So I'm all for that. Stretching definitely counts as movement in any way that you can try to get more movement in. Um, another question is, oh, do you have some guide or visual help that you can share with us in order to train the workers on the correct postures in their workstation? Great question. So reference posture is something that you're going to see. You'll see pictures of that all the time, right? You'll see that, per that person perfectly sitting there, uh, sitting at their desk. And we've all seen that. I know we've all seen that. And yet I can guarantee that we're not all sitting like that or that our workstations don't even adjust for us to be able to get to that. Um, and so that's something that I think really comes into play in the training is that sure, I watched the video on how to adjust my chair, or how to adjust my monitor. Um, but can I actually tell if I'm sitting like that? And I often encourage people like if, if I'm teaching you how to do assessments or if I'm doing a training session where we're talking about those adjustments, um, I often encourage people to, to take a picture. So if it were me, um, I would ask my coworker or, you know, a friend or whichever to take a picture of me from the side to get myself all set up and that I think that I'm working in this great posture and get a pic get them to take a picture of me from the side so that I can look at that and kind of see what my posture does look like. Um, 
I do that often even when I'm doing one-on-one -on -one assessments. So I'll take a picture and then I'll show the person and we kind of talk about, I take one at the beginning, I take one at the end. So we can talk about some of the hazards or not so great postures that we see and then talk about at the end um, to show how their postures maybe are improved after we've changed some things. Okay, here's another question um, it, as per the example that I shared. So this, uh, uh, they've also moved to a new building. Everyone was given a sit-stand desk and they have the same issue of the desk not going low enough. What are some of the interventions you suggested? Uh, so that definitely is going to depend on the type of equipment, whether or not it's the whole desk that's height adjustable or if it's one of those units that sits on the desk. Um, for the specific example that I gave, um, it was trying to to educate the employer really on you know the hazards that we saw so you've got some people who where their chair doesn't go up high enough um, and the desk can't go low enough so they still have a mismatch in the working height so it could be a matter of changing out the gas cylinders in the chairs those height adjustable cylinders um, maybe making a few workstations that were kind of you know if you weren't going to go and retrofit all 300 height adjustable desks maybe making a select few of them more um, to accommodate the shorter individuals right so having the taller chair um, or having and making sure you have a footrest obviously um, or adding a keyboard tray which kind of defeats the purpose obviously of what they were going for in this height adjustable desk but giving those as options um, and i'm happy to chat with you more if you want to to let me know the specific equipment that you that you've put in place um, and i can definitely help with some interventions there Okay, so being mindful of time, this session was recorded, so we will send it out to everybody. If you think of anything, any other questions, um, please feel free, contact Pro Ergonomics. You can call or email us, happy to answer any questions. And uh, thanks so much for tuning in. Hopefully you have a great day, and please join us for another webinar next month. Take care.